Hello, how are you doing? We're back today. We got one more mission we had to just for completeness. We had to fill this sky with water. So what we have here is a, instead of that super light uh, cargo bay with nothing in it, we've got, uh, I think it is yeah, <laughs> nearly 10,000 uh, liters, since a kilogram is a liter. Um, we've got a uh, oh, good bit of water. But it's still only 55% full, which unfortunately leads to some sloshing around. Um, so we had to, you know, move the rockets more outboard to line up our... Oops. Line up our center of mass, and it still kind of tilts a little too far forward sometimes. But anyway, we're going to start it off real quick. We're going to go for a flight, and then stay tuned, if you will. We're talk about some other uh, interesting stuff and we'll do a little compare and contrast to some aviation standards we'll make it the most esoteric vertical market uh, live stream there may ever have been uh, but we'll start off with flying because everyone's here to see something fly right or crash <laughs> crash <laughs> Nobody, I do not want to see crashes we're trying desperately not to crash that is true we don't want to spill all this water it cost a lot to get the water to the surface. <laughs> Hi, then, everybody. Hello. We do a lot more wobbling. You'll see everything Oof. is a lot slower. Oh. Because we have... And we're only going to go to a thousand feet. We're going to go a thousand meters up. We're going to coast and flop over and land. We're not going to try and go somewhere distant. Because even though this is the dual-engined... Um, Centaur with two RL-10 engines at 109-ish kilonewtons each. Uh, that's a lot of heavy water. <laughs> 10,000 kilograms. How far is it going to go? Of water. Well, it can do the hop, but it's going to have a lot harder time. You just you'll see it. It just generally moves slower. <laughs> so we got everything dialed in, and we're literally just going to take off upwards. This is my usual hopper test sequence. I don't normally take off over to the moon base. That just slows things down. So you see, he takes off half decently. Huh? Not not too bad a speed. Let's see here. We want our velocities. It thinks we're docked because I actually put the uh, the command pod on the docking port, <laughs> even though the command pod's this big. <laughs> It's almost a little person-looking thing. Almost. <laughs> Ish. Ish. Our little guy here. Alright, come on down to a thousand, will ya? There we go. Just waiting for it to kick in there. So it does, uh, I had to modify the PID values, and it actually will tie into a thing that we talk about later where almost everything about our flights um, have been the same. It could be the same logic used on every single one of these craft, except depending upon the max weight and the engine performance, you need a different set of PID values for each mission profile. And there's a concept of... Um, we're burning a lot more fuel, so we better drop on down. <laughs> um... Uh, there's a concept of a, a table-driven program, which is to say a, a, a table of values for different stages of flight, and those would be the different values for your PID controller for different stages, or depending on how much mass you have. So much of uh, space uh, has been uh, one-off missions uh, that everything got just coded to meet the mission, and not coded in a sort of a generic fashion to deal with all sorts of unexpected situations. Because they knew you were going to be on the moon, you weren't going to be in a, a place that had more gravity than the moon for some reason. So to make sure we don't go too fast with all this extra water, we're just, we've maxed our descent speed to 10 meters a second, which is where you're seeing the little bursting to maintain speed. It'll take us a little longer to get down to altitude but it's a lot more gentle. 
than uh, the way we were going before, where it was all just sort of drop out of the sky to the next target altitude. Uh, we could probably get it, let it go up to about 220, so it doesn't take so long, but... <laughs> Seems to be a little bumpy. Um... <laughs> That's interesting. There we go. Now nah, we're getting there. I'm running out of fuel <laughs> super quick. Oh. This ain't good. I must have left the poor thing. Oh. Quick, quick, put out the landing gear. Ah. Oh. Oh. Oh, 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 oh dang oh, it. Oh. Wah, wah, wah. This is what happens when you can't programmatically control your roll. <laughs> slow your roll. I can't. Slow your roll. <laughs> I can't slow my roll. That's the problem. This is just going to sit here and wobble back and forth like a crying little baby. You crying baby spacecraft. Look at him. Look at his little nozzles go. Oh. Wee, wee, <laughs> wee. All right. Anyway, enough of that. That so, did not go the way you That did planned, not go I'm well. Assuming. No, no, that was not how it planned. But that's one of the problems I've been having. Anytime you, you try and do a quad landing and you're on a downhill, well, you start getting more and more nose down until it registers that you're under the cutoff height. So in any case, we'll try her one more time just for just for giggles. And then we'll get into some of the other stuff I was uh, alluding to earlier. So, uh, it's a little interesting. I thought it was going to... Oh, well, isn't that fun? <laughs> Just jump into the sky for no reason. I don't know what... Actually, I do know why that is here. Why did it do that? So, um, this is a, uh, an issue I've had a couple of times in, in when I rearrange the rocket and move the command pod around and so forth. That the command pod itself gets placed above the ground. And you you want the command pod to have all these values of zero 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 so that when it puts you on the on the uh, planet, you're sitting on the ground. If your Y position is like literally if you do this then you start off four meters above the ground and you fall. And then you bounce off the ground, apparently, and flip around to acrobatics. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, sometimes I that will get uh, tweaked. And it seems to... For some reason it just leaps up from zero to like four-ish or five-ish meters. And then you start doing that little... You, they drop you in as you design the craft. And so gravity ensues, and you bounce, and... So anyway, there we go. Well, that's better. <laughs> so, get him back locked on to target. Thousand meters. You ready? Three, two, one, go. Here we go again. One more try for a soft landing. Actually, we'll try and take him over to a flatter area, I think. That's what we... We need to not land on this sort of hillside right here. Whee! <laughs> That's pretty. Yeah, I I love the way the the look of the of the sim is. Turns out there is not a fully functional lunar sim the way I was thinking of one that could handle everything regolith and. Tech, uh, terrain and so on. Did you really think there was one? I well, the Google has Google Moon, which has all the terrain at least, um, and the the gravity simulation. If you want to, you know, they have their their what was it? Google Flight Sim that you, you could used to fly over Google Maps with, uh, or Google Earth with rather. All right, let's drop down quick before we burn all our fuel. <laughs> Did we start off with full fuel? Is that my problem? Did I like completely drain the tank or something? I don't know. I honestly don't know. 
I didn't look. I did not look. Whether I will have to check next time. And clearly, ten meters a second is a little overly <laughs> overly sensitive. <laughs> we, maybe we need to go down just a touch faster than that. <laughs> Unless, of course, I guess we want to do observations along the way. I suppose could do something along those lines. I think, yeah, it's going to keep it at 90 during the descent. We're going to go ahead and let it move. Where's a good landing spot? Probably over this way. Doing good. Luckily, the uh, quad tanks, the lander tanks, um, have their own fuel. The tanks, of course, the tanks have their own fuel. The lander <laughs> thrusters have their own fuel tanks, separate from the main lift tank here. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Ah. Uh. I hate when that happens. Doink! <laughs> wee wee! Hi. Wee! 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 Alright, yay! yay. <laughs> Not so soft touchdown, but. Not even close to soft touchdown. Not even <laughs> close to a soft touchdown. <laughs> But I've got so many parts, and this is one of my most complex rockets as far as part count. So, um, but really, it's just all that extra mass of water makes the thing unwieldy. <laughs> and as soon as you, you know, especially because I, th I think they're actually taking into account the horizontal position. So once you go horizontal, your liquid fuels... So payloads aren't going to be like that, though. Payloads are going to be, you know, well, compactly in there. It's not going to be fluid, is it? Uh, well, if it is fluid, you'd hope they'd have baffles to keep it in separate compartments so that you don't have this shifting center of gravity, depending on how much fuel you've used. Um, so this quad lander system has its, has its uh, pluses and minuses. Of course, we are only using four thrusters in most real implementations. They have uh, four main lift thrusters or deorbit thrusters, and then the directional typical uh, reaction control system of six engines going in different directions so that you have full full control over all directions. We're using this humongous um, reaction control wheel system, which is uh, the entire diameter of the craft. So it is pretty large, but I don't know if it would be this strongly reactive, uh, especially with that much mass in it. But you see, it all just goes so super slow when you've got that much mass going around. Uh, and this is what would be considered a very large lander. <laughs> so that was the first couple of flights, and then I just wanted to take a few minutes and talk about something completely different. Well, not completely different. So Not to us. Not to us, no. <laughs> so let me just rearrange the windows here a little bit. And uh, I want to give you a taste of the the engineering side or the engineering standard side of aerospace. And let's see, here we go. Yay! It worked. I got both of them up, and I'm not showing the OBS Studio in Infinity Mirror style, <laughs> <laughs> Infinity Camera style. So this uh, on the left we have the face standard standard future airborne compatible. Oh, first off, let me start off. Everything I'm showing you here is 100% completely um, public domain or publicly available. There is no proprietary nature to any of it in the sense that uh, it's. And I'll show you. I'll have the links in the in the video afterwards as well. Um, I had to adjust that just a touch. Okay. So, um, on the left, we have the face standard, which is uh, primarily for airborne uh, military and civilian aircraft. 
and we have a priority puppy interrupt. Sorry, folks. We have a puppy interrupt. <laughs> Come here, you. Do you want up up? I don't know what he wants. Do you want up up? <laughs> Yourself. Come in. Come on. Oh, this one. This the good puppy, <laughs> or I should say the the calm puppy. <laughs> So are we going to talk aviation stuff? You want to talk aviation stuff? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, on the left. Look over that way. Yes. Yeah, that one. This is the face. <laughs> is the face standard. And that's for uh, primarily terrestrial-based uh, aviation. Uh, it's a military standard, but it's also for uh, thought of for civilian use. And then on the right, we have the core flight system. Uh, which is uh, something I was just introduced to recently and have been getting into and, and will continue to get into much more deeply in the days to come. And what I noticed about them is the parallels. Now, I've been working with the face standard for well into a decade now, and so I'm much more familiar with it. But when I read the, the initial information about the core flight system, I noticed a lot of parallels. So... Uh, one of the issues, or one of the things that drove the face standard, uh, there we go, was the fact that uh, every new aircraft system was getting in incrementally, incrementally, not incrementally, <laughs> exponentially more expensive, to the point where they said, at some point, we will spend our entire budget on a single aircraft, and what good is that for the Air Force? Um, and so they wanted to spread out the cost of the aircraft design in the future, and one of the ways they did that was with the Joint Strike Fighter project, where they brought in a teamwork of various countries, uh, 14, I think, all together, uh, to work uh, together on one design so that we could all spread out the cost of the development, if you will. So one of the things I thought was interesting is in the uh, the, the front page, or it is literally the front page of the face standard, this quote from the Vice Admiral. Uh, you have a choice. You can either create your own future, or you can become the victim of a future that someone else creates for you. So by seizing the transfer transformational opportunities, you're seizing the opportunity to create your own future. And that's just a generally decent statement for anybody for just about any field of endeavor, uh, but is especially true for, um, uh, for military procurement and uh, aircraft procurement and design and creation. So for all these years, aircraft have been essentially one-off systems. You would buy everything from one vendor uh, as a prime. They would subcontract out various parts. Uh, but then if there was a problem with the aircraft, any part of the aircraft, you had to go back to that one vendor. And so you had created this vendor lock that the military despised. Um, Vendors love it, of course. Uh, <laughs> the idea behind FACE is that we can all work together cooperatively and still in competition with each other by having standard interfaces between each layer, uh, between each part of the um, of the avionic system. So, I believe it is page, it's page 5 internally, but page 33. Here's the actual infrastructure of the FACE standard. I don't know how well you can read that. It's pretty small on my screen, too. Oh, well, zoom in a bit. So this is the, the, the basic layers. You have your platform devices and sensors and displays and input-output devices, all your hardware interface. And there would be some way to connect that up to your main system. It's usually over some standard interface like network or various serial ports and the like. Serial ports for all you millennials out there is how we used to connect to the internet. <laughs> At ridiculously high speeds of 115.2. 9600 baud. Uh, which are still being used. In fact, mil standard 1553 isn't all that terribly fast either. Uh, relative to Ethernet, anyway. Uh, and then those various hardware device drivers would come in through various I.O. segment get into your platform specific segment that would be everything that's specific to that hardware board the chip the board support package all of those kind of low level things and then uh, the idea was that you could separate these layers that you could have a transport segment that communicates between different systems 
and then a portable component segment that would then be something similar to apps in an app store. Uh, they, they basically saw the iPhone or the Android model and they said if we could do that with avionics then the military could buy stock off-the-shelf avionics from the commercial world which have been flight proven in a lot of different aircraft uh, and then just add their secret sauce and not have to build everything else from scratch. Turns out the same basic problem happened in space. We had a whole lot of different uh, spacecraft and you have the same kind of issues, except in this case you're dealing with low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, geosynchronous orbit, and deep space. You got radiation issues, size, weight, and power is a concern as always uh, in aviation and aerospace. But you have even more limited memory processing power, uh, a requirement for autonomy and fault management because you can't bring it back into the shop, generally speaking. Big satellite telescopes aside, very few things get in the maintenance uh, checkup while they're in orbit. <laughs> um, space station, I guess, would be the other one. So the uh, in the space world, they said, let's do, well, I don't know who inspired who exactly here, but I think they were all sort of parallel, so kind of an example of parallel invention across two very similar fields. So um, much like ground-based aviation flight software for space can't be blue screening on you. It's got to be very reliable. It's got to be able to reboot itself if need be, things like that. It's got to be real-time response. So this block diagram is an example telescope. Uh, uh, well, it's called an observatory. That could actually be anything in space that's doing any kind of sensing and not necessarily photo observatory. So you have your various instruments, infrared cameras, visible cameras, things like that. You've got your communication buses of various standards, uh, RF down, uh, or your, blah, blah, blah. your telemetry, your transponders and transmitters to go through your high gain antenna. Your high gain antenna has to have gimbals in order to point in the right direction. Um, you've got your station keeping rockets, your inertial management units. Um, and then over here is all of your propulsion side. You've got your what amounts to a plumbing diagram of, of rocket nozzles and fuel lines and so forth. And that propulsion comes to uh, a set of uh, propulsion stages, a lot of these stages that we've seen in the game. So I noticed this. They have, uh, you can't really see it. It's called vehicle separation wires, these little wires down here on the bottom. And uh, essentially, those wires are what's broken when you stage each part of the rocket. And that's how they confirm that you've broken away that stage. Um, so in any case, it's kind of generalized. You know, there's a solar panel. You have gimbal control to keep the solar panel looking at the sun. So this is kind of a generalized everything that you would have for a satellite or some sort of uh, probe. It would also be a lander. Um, so this is pretty pretty typical and then there's some some greater details i won't quite get into all the various details of that level i just want to get into here uh here's their motivation they want to use the complete uh commercial off-the-shelf solutions do not exist in space <laughs> you can't just buy everything off the shelf and stick it together who doesn't know that well, it doesn't exist in, arrows in the terrestrial side either, necessarily, but they're trying to get to something similar to that. Uh, and so anytime you design an aircraft or a spacecraft, you've been starting over again. And same kind of thing. There's reuse in the past was very minimal. And so you, several years ago, I'm not sure the dating of the timing of this, but the, this is the Goddard Space Flight Center. Um two missions they gave it a code <laughs> i work at goddard city's flight center and under code 582 that doesn't sound scary at all but it shouldn't be because it's a totally normal thing for this crowd <laughs> i'm not sure how they do this numbering scheme but it seems pretty common <laughs> and so they had the same kind of thing they had had a number of different aviations so 
the folks behind FACE uh, are from all over the aerospace industry for commercial mil aero, um, military and commercial aerospace. All over the world. Uh, well, they started off uh, U.S. only, and I believe they're opening up to... Uh, to uh, well, the standards are open to anyone, but the meetings were were restricted to U.S. citizen only. I think just because of the fear of some chit chat chatter that might happen uh, that they didn't want to just accidentally get out. Um, the meetings are held in various host sites, either hotels or or large aviation companies. Um, so on the space flight side, though. They had something similar. They had all these different projects, all these different missions that had gone together. And NASA does, uh, in, in, to some degree, uh, does, primarily designs their spacecraft. And then most, or not most, but a lot of the building is done by subcontractors to NASA. And so a lot of these companies overlap. Of course, the big five, Lockheed and uh, Northrop Grumman and... I don't even think there's five left. It's mostly Northrop and Lockheed, <laughs> by and large, for the big names. Uh, there's a bunch of middle-sized names, uh, middle company sizes. They all were on the list of contributors here in the face document. Um, some 140-ish, I think, companies were involved in the development of the face standard. Um, and it looks like there's at least several dozen, if not... Uh, hundreds of different project experience being brought together from the NASA side for this. So, same kind of idea. They they want to avoid reinventing the wheel. They want to avoid having to, um, uh, you know, rebuild from scratch for each mission. And so, let me get down here. So, that's not the one. I should have put in the number. Where did you go? Otto. Oh, there we are. Otto, tell me where it is. He's really looking. He's watching. He is. He's so smart. <laughs> Here we go. This is more or less the similar diagram to this. You've got hardware components, like I.O. devices. You've got device driver layer your device driver layer, your operating system layer, uh, your platform specific segment contains your operating system in the face world. Let's see if we can get back down. Here we go. Here's an, another version of the face uh, definition that, that sort of shows the same kind of separation. Yeah. Hardware at the bottom, hardware interface, operating system. Inside the operating system you have device drivers, health monitoring, What's called the operating system segment and face is the operating system segment here, not surprisingly. This is an old um, hat to you because you know all of this stuff. Yeah. But. Well, I'm, what I'm kind of trying to show is just how similar these two are. And I don't know how much overlap there are in as far as people at these companies. I mean, obviously the people involved with Lockheed Martin are involved in both of these standards. Yes. I don't know if they're the same people. <laughs> yeah. <I want laughs> or to know if they're that. from different companies <laughs> or a different subdivision. Sub, um, Subdivisions? What do they call them? I guess subdivisions yeah. of the company. Um, but it's interesting. There's a couple of things that, that, that are really key and different between these two. So because on a terrestrial face environment, the, the spacecraft takes off and lands generally in the same day. They usually don't stay up, you know, hours or days and days at a time, with the a few small exceptions. Um so you have a chance to get to the hardware, you can turn it off, you can reboot it, you can change out software in the device. Um, and for security purposes, you want that to be locked down once it leaves the lab and stay locked down as long as it's in the field. And on so while you can have a system in the face environment that allows you to load a new program on the fly, it's not typical. In fact, almost all of these layers are different libraries that are all linked together into one amorphous blob, as the space people call it, uh, which is the fa one final executable. These aren't necessarily separate programs running on the same machine. They're all linked together into one program. Um, on the opposite side, 
you have space systems that are going off into space, maybe never to be touched again. And so you have to have dynamic upload of new code if you want to change the mission, take adjustments based off of how good your, your engine performance was in space. You didn't fire your engine long enough, your orbit has changed, you want to change the program. Um, so they have to be able to accept dynamic loads, if you will. Um, and because of that, I, I think this, this uh, CFS system is much closer to what you would see on your Android or your iPhone device, where you go to the App Store and you say, I want to download telemetry for a telemetry read-write uh, 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 module that handles all the radio calls to send and receive telemetry data. You can just grab that from the, the App Store and bring it in, and you can actually dynamically load it and debug it uh, with earth, earthbound simulations of all this. They actually have simulations on the CFS side. They have a simulation that's Windows-based that allows you to, to test out and, and inter, interact with everything. And as long as you talk to these sort of light blue layers up here, these middleware layers, as long as you're talking to those, then what you write for Windows will run on your embedded target. Well, which is usually some PC-104 uh, board or maybe a PowerPC system. So I just thought that it was interesting how well or how closely these two, um, uh, how similar these two systems are, but it really they were trying to solve the same problems. Uh, how many times there's, uh, it, in this project, they mention at least three lander programs, Morpheus, um, lunar testbed one, I think it was called. I'm forgetting now. And one other uh, four-legged, four-jetted. I guess Morpheus had one center jet, but uh, retro-jetted style landers. Several of them have been made from this same framework, and generally with uh, under one-year deadlines. So it looks like a very good framework for starting your own systems and building your own systems up. And one of the key issues, of course, is you want to, oh, here we go. Here's another set of layers, application layers, and where they actually mention some of the operating systems. So here's another parallel. POSIX is one of the acceptable OS levels inside FACE as well. In fact, that's one of their primary recommendations. And VXWorks is also a, a real-time operating system that is used on both layers. Then they get into some of the gory details about what type of board and, and operating system are combined and so forth. So I don't want to get too far into the weeds. I probably already am. Yes, <laughs> kind of am already. Yes. But it is kind of interesting just how closely these two uh, compare to each other, um, both in, in general needs and in the proposed solutions. Um, I think one of the primary differences is that the space side is all on GitHub. It's open source. And face is actually almost all standard, not code. So what face was out to do was to create this standard that everyone was used to, in that they would say everyone's going to use an operating system that operates to the POSIX standard. Here's all the POSIX APIs, which ones you can use, which ones you can't. And over here, they said everyone's going to talk to the operating system using an abstraction layer so that those calls are always the same. And what you actually call on the underlying operating system is handled by these OS abstraction layers, which is very common, actually. We've, I've seen this in several different companies trying to have a runtime on multiple hardware. So anyway, I didn't want to get too far down the line. I think I already talked longer than I expected. Uh, <laughs> but you know, when you get, start getting geeky on it, and we got in the, this. So they talk about each section of of the extra services. So there's a whole build environment on this side. On Face, you they do have a Windows or a Linux example called Balsa, which is a, a code based example of all of these layers talking together. Um. And I'll, I'll include the links on the video for, for all of this. Um, and here we go. So this is where the rest of this 
is pretty much API lists for each layer. There's software bus, which is how you communicate between one application and another. Um, talks about how the structure Just is. so you know, no one else on this yeah. earth understands all of this like you do, and no one gets excited <laughs> like you do. Poor bud. <laughs> do you understand me? Poor bud does. Do you understand me? He's watching. Whatever, just feed me. <laughs> feed me, keep me warm. I like it. All right, then. <laughs> It's all a bunch of little bright blinky lights. Blinky lights rule the world. Yay, blinky lights. All right, well, now we're definitely going off into the weeds. Yes. All right, folks, well, thanks for that. I just wanted to kind of give you a, a touch of what's involved when it comes to uh, avionics software standards. And um, if you want to start looking into designing your own spacecraft uh control systems and using the CFE or the CFS rather um, it's freely available and easy to pretty easy to set up uh, face is certainly not something hobbyists get into <laughs> this is pretty much only professional mill arrow folks will get into this complicated of a standard just for fun <laughs> but uh, CFS looks like it might be interesting uh, as a way to sort of extend the game, just like the Complex Rockets group is using the Open MCT, which is uh, much like we were using the chart charting software, um, but it's the NASA open source uh, telemetry package for your spacecraft. And this is the open source infrastructure for the code on your spacecraft. So, anyway... If you have any questions, you want to see more, maybe you want to talk about it, just feel free to drop me a message on any of the various platforms. And you tell them this time. Like and subscribe! Like and subscribe! <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Thanks for putting up with me tonight. We'll see you later. Bye! Bye.